Hi, I have Jen Barth here with Big Small Brands. Hi, Jen. Hi, Amy. Great to see you. Yeah, thank you for coming on the pod. So Jen Barth has is a I, I would want to say that she's a PR research expert because she's a lot of her background is in PR research and it's very distinct background. And so we're just going to talk to Jen about PR research. What is that? How do you go about the research process and, and why does PR research make for a better PR campaign? So I don't know, just kick us off with, you know, what is PR research? Well, thank you again. I'm so excited to be here. I've been a follower of the podcast for a while now and definitely gotten great nuggets that have helped me in my day-to-day -day work. And so it's fun to be here and share some info. Um, I have to, when you ask me that question, I think back to my very first job was in PR. I sort of fell into that first role like a lot of people do. And I remember early on, it was because I've always been a person that has been sort of curious by nature. So when I look back to my favorite childhood book, it was Harriet the Spy, right? And Nancy Drew and that sort of like, what's going on? And I didn't realize it when I got involved in my career that that curiosity was sort of this through line that would um, take me through various roles. Pretty early on in PR at that time, and I think I'm probably dating myself, but there weren't as many connections between the various disciplines. And I remember asking my boss, great, we're, we're doing all of this work to get the media to pay attention um, to our company, which was in the retail business. Are we selling any more clothes? And she said, <laughs> that's question. not PR, right? Um, and she said, that's not PR's job. Our job is just to get the media hits. And I thought, okay, but that seems like not, not real enough. And so I said, how would I find out if we were selling more clothes? And she said, uh, you can go down the hall and ask Larry in research. And to this day, I still remember that guy's name because I didn't even really know what research was other than what we did in college. And so I think early on, even though it wasn't formally in me from a training perspective, I understood that there was this connection between words and messages that communicators try to work, try to get out and the business goal that an organization has. And so over the years, I think my roles have always stayed in the realm of communications, but I have gotten closer and closer to that world of what is the end user? What is the customer? What is the client needing to make happen? Um, and what does success look like for them so that PR and communications and marketing can support that? So I think when you think about research and PR research, of course, there's a lot of secondary research that we all have, and there's certainly no shortage of amazing information out there. Right, we can read studies. We have 24 seven news cycle. There's a lot of research that's commissioned by other industry leaders and that's all really helpful. Um, and we can also take a look at things like social media analytics and website metrics, but that's really just one small piece of how an organization can solve a business problem. And so what I tend to focus on and where I think PR folks um, are finding more and more value over the last couple of years is in that sort of primary research, right? Because nothing can really replace the value of just a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I think it's not only the, the fact that you're talking one-on-one -on -one, or in some cases in you know groups, but that you think about who's asking the question, how the question is asked. And so from a PR standpoint, you wanna make sure that when you think about research, there's a lot of approaches, but the value can be many. So a lot of times PR research can really help PR teams hone in on messaging, right? So it might very well be that you have a client or, or an organization you're working on and maybe the messaging isn't getting through. Maybe it's not resonating. Maybe there's something new they need to share and you could sit around inside the four walls of your organization all day brainstorming what information people want to hear, but until you actually sort of test them and do a gut check, you may or may not be right. So sometimes it's just to sort of make some small tweaks or some um, changes that can make a really big difference depending on who you're talking to and how they inform information. Sometimes PR research can do a lot more though. There are times where um, you might be working on a certain media goal and you want to have a headline that will obviously resonate with the press. And where do you get that information? 
sometimes it can come from internally, but often those insights are much better when they come from the people who you are working with. So whether you mean like your clients or yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. So there are various audiences that different organizations connect with, but I've been in situations where businesses have spent lots of time, internal staff time, money, resources, creating messaging and going back and forth and internally revising it and revising it. And my guess is you've been there a few times with organizations. Um, And then suddenly if you step back and someone else walks in the room that has sort of fresh eyes, they can sometimes see something that you're not seeing when you're so deeply in the middle of it, right? So the idea of getting an outside perspective is really not that complicated, but I think sometimes we just don't realize that that's, that can make a huge difference. So when you think about what would be the value of research for a PR person, some of it is just getting a different perspective, right? Um, sometimes it's that internally um, executives, um, folks in the C-suite, founders, people who are deeply connected to an idea or a, or a theory they have or a product line, and it's like their baby, right? And so the idea that you might need to make a change can be really hard. Um, But if you hear from a top client, a board member, uh, an investor, or just a stakeholder who kind of represents the type of people you wanna be doing business with, if they come back to you with perspectives, suddenly it's not a personal sort of um, challenge between people internally, right? But it's, this is not what you, Amy, or you, Jen, or you so-and-so are thinking. The ego is not involved. This is practical information rooted in fact. And I think as PR folks, we're always looking for what's the, what's the real information that we can take and then do all the, all the magic that the PR teams do. Yeah. So, um, and, and also when we worked together, cause we worked together mm-hmm. on actually a DEI campaign while well, rebranding yeah. a DEI company. And what helped me with the research that you did was it kind of gave me like a confidence in my gut check. Like we mm-hmm. know things as in our gut as marketers or just everyday people. Um, but sometimes you need that research to kind of back your thoughts, because especially when you're dealing with something as possibly tricky as DEI, you got to be sure. Right. And so yeah. with you, and I remember dialoguing with you and having these conversations like, so am I off here? And then you kind of saying, well, not really. And so, and then I don't know if you want to talk about the process, what is your research process and how do you yeah. get this information? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, And I have um, a couple approaches. No matter what type of research you're doing, and you know, again, you can do surveys, you can do phone interviews, you can do one-on-one interviews. Um, Back pre-COVID, we did a lot of in-person focus groups. The beauty of being virtual now is you can actually talk to a lot of more people all over the world, right? So we're taking this concept and playing around with different formats, but the end of the day, you you have to start by asking yourself a couple questions. What do you internally know? Um, research just to confirm a gut is important. And I think if there's sort of a hunch or some working knowledge, it's great to make sure, especially in a moment in time like we are in now, that let's just make sure that all those assumptions are still accurate, right? So that's a good enough reason to do some research. But more importantly, what do you not know? And even before you move forward, what is actionable? So I think a lot of times, and certainly back in the day where there were bigger budgets, and when you're talking with large teams that have access to a lot more internal resources, a lot of people would do research just to sort of get some interesting information. And that's great. But I, I'm a highly practical person. I know, I know you and I share that. And so I'm always looking at, let's say we get a bunch of information. What are you actually able to do with it? And so when I think about how organizations are set up, I usually do a little bit of internal research with internal stakeholders. And I know you and I um, have collaborated on that in the project we worked on, because you really wanna make sure that wherever you take these conversations, there is the ability to listen, act on it, and that there are built-in structures in place to pay attention. 
And even though that sounds really basic, I can't tell you how many projects I did earlier in my career. Um, and, you know, I think this is typical of many folks in the marketing services world where you create this amazing product, right? A, a plan, a recommendation and insights and here's everything you should do, but you can't force them to act on it, right? I mean, we try. That's true. <laughs> that's not so I typically start with asking a couple of internal stakeholders these questions. Then I typically do a survey um, or one-on-one -on -one interviews with key stakeholders who are either perceived to be really important to the success of the project or possible um, stumbling blocks in, in the success if, for example, what we uncover is not what they are hoping to hear. Um, and, you know, we all, I think, are great at understanding that successful leaders are successful for many reasons. And sometimes ego and pride and a vision is, is incredible. And it's what makes for really successful teams. And also, no one <laughs> wants to hear <laughs> that maybe their vision of the value they bring is not the same as what top clients are saying. Or maybe they're um, addressing a need that the marketplace doesn't really need at the moment. Or maybe some of their clients have gone to competitors and were kind of afraid to tell them. And it's hard information, but it's better than not knowing, right? And so that's part of the internal process. And then we create um, a screener, right? So we identify what are the screening criteria that we're gonna use to recruit for our research. So if you're doing a huge survey, um, you know, you can say, I'm going to send out an online survey to hundreds or thousands of people and, you know, ask them up front some basic demographic information. And that's helpful. Um, the, the type of research that I do is much more in the qualitative side. So um, that's the sort of not so much the who and the what, but the why and the how. And so if you're going to take time to have a conversation with someone and ask someone who's obviously busy busier than ever these days to, to give you 30 minutes, an hour, a couple of hours of their time, you wanna make sure you're talking to the right people and that you are asking the right questions um, and that you're giving time in that conversation, both for basic questions that the organization needs to answer as well as free form dialogue. So I, I know in that project we collaborated on, there were sort of some basic things that they needed to know to inform what the next phase of the project would be, but there was always, I found, even more interesting um, insights that came kind of in that free form conversation at the end of the dialogue. Some people would email back afterwards, all sorts of things. And it was just interesting to see that if we had simply left it as, you know, a five question survey, we would not know any of the things that we know. So, but what do you do with all the uncoverings uh, when you're doing qualitative research? How do you quantify it? How do you, I mean, can you like put marks on all of the answers and kind of like, okay, this answer is bucket one, this answer is in bucket two, this, and then so we have more in bucket two. So then we're going to go with this bucket two strategy. I mean, how does that yeah. work? I mean, it's a great question. And I think obviously every project is different, but I think a lot about audience segments and, um, you know, from a PR standpoint, you're always thinking about, you know, different messaging frameworks, right? So there may be some working theories that you head into the project with because you know, for example, that the organization organizes customers or clients or partners into certain buckets. So maybe it's by industry or by, the role that an organization a leader plays, or maybe it's in the service line that they purchase from you, right? So um, I work with a lot of professional services firms where they may have three or four different service lines that cut across different industries and clients. Um, and so one way to look at that would be, let's talk to every client we know who is a CMO because they're gonna have certain needs and that's helpful. But sometimes the way to look at it is not how you might imagine. And so the beauty of having good conversations up front in, in before you start research is that you want to basically invest in as structured a process as possible that also allows for a lot of flexibility with what, um, what happens next. And so what often happens is I do a series of rapid fire interviews and, you know, phone, Zoom um, is obviously what we're doing mostly these days. 
um, and I imagine for the foreseeable future. And then I sit down and just put into buckets various themes that I see. And I actually don't limit them to the, um, you know, the categories that the clients might have seen because you just wanna sort of see, are there common themes that go across these groups? And sometimes it's really obvious. You're like, oh, wow, uh, you know, 40% of the people that we talk to have are literally not even getting the communications. They're not seeing them. They're not <laughs> absorbing them. They're completely ignoring them. So the client's theory was that people were not signing up for this particular service because they read it and made a thoughtful decision not to register for this conference they were putting on. But the truth is they were not, it was going into spam. It was not even resonating. Maybe the marketing messaging, once they opened the email, didn't hit them. Um, the website, when they go to the website, the brand does not reflect the experience they had with them one-on-one. -on -one. So there's a million reasons why marketing and PR may not be landing with folks. But until you really dig in and ask those questions, you just don't know. Sometimes what ends up happening is we create tools that help teams um, internally understand these groups better. So, um, you know, I think you're familiar with the idea of personas, right, where you sort of take um, a collection of what you heard and you try to bucket them not so much by demographic or other basic um, sort of criteria that I think a lot of people think when they think about traditional research and you put them more into mindset. Um, an example, I'll actually give an example of when I first got into research, I was actually selling research services for a giant global research firm back in the day. And I really didn't know much about research. I mean, this was a while back. And I remember saying to my boss, I don't get it. Can I sit in on one of these focus groups and just, I don't, I mean, how hard can this be? Our client was a retailer who targeted um, women who were my same age group. And according to, in my mind, the same demographic, they were new moms who, and I was a new mom at the time, and they wanted to understand their shopping patterns. And so I remember saying to my boss, well, I'll just sit out on any focus group. They're all the same. And he sort of looked at me and I understood after the project that even within this very narrowly defined demographic, which was women, I think between the ages of let's call it 32 and 35 who were new moms and lived in California. I mean, I, I thought I saw myself in the description on paper, but when I sat in this room at the time of probably 10 to 12 people, none of them shopped the way I shopped. Ooh, none of them that's interesting. walked the aisles of the store like I did. We all had completely different ways that we did this very simple thing. And that's something as simple as going to the grocery store, right? So when you extrapolate that out into more complex um, professional services sales or, um, or products or services that people may not even understand yet, and so marketing is even more important and PR is even more critical because it can really come down to the words, right? And the images that help them understand what you do. You start to realize that people consume information um, in a lot of ways because we're all human beings, but we all do um, absorb information and make decisions in different ways. So some mm -hmm. people are gonna make them from a business standpoint in collaboration with a lot of their team members. Some of them are gonna make it kind of on their own. Now with everybody sort of spread out, a lot of those sort of hallway conversations where you can kind of grab someone a few minutes before a meeting and sort of check in and say, hey, Amy, we're heading into this meeting. I want to make sure we're on the same page. And then we walk into that room together, right? And we're in lockstep. A lot of that's lost now because we're all on Zooms. And <laughs> yeah, so I think those little pieces are important to think about when you think about having these conversations. Well, right now, I would think research would be more important than ever because businesses are changing. Maybe mm -hmm. they want to, maybe they don't, but they're not quite sure how to go about it. So a brick and mortar might be going to a digital format. So I don't know. Have you noticed that a lot of people are interested in research or that maybe they just don't know enough about it to know yeah. that they need it? It's interesting. I mean, it's hard to, it's so hard to know, right? Because we're, we're all still getting used to what life is like right now. But here's what I'll say. Um, I have always believed, and I said this 10 years ago when I started my firm and five years ago when I got really much more focused on the research part of marketing. Um, and I think I'll say it forever is that investing a little bit in the short term to gather practical information 
not only sets you up for success when you have a lot of clarity in your plan, but it also allows you to be really flexible and the word that we all are sick of, but very nimble um, should things change. So sometimes people just do research um, because they want to get information and that's helpful, but you don't know what you're gonna need to know maybe two months from now, six months from now, Nobody could have anticipated all the changes that were happening, gonna happen this year, but organizations that at least have a good baseline and a kind of a, a good connection with folks they can do that gut check with are gonna be better positioned to make decisions quickly, to pivot, another word I'm sick of, but we, we do it every day. It is what it and, is. And also to, um, figure out how to be more resourceful with the limited and time and resources you have because gone are the days where we have giant budgets and giant teams and lots of people who can get together quickly in a conference room and make a decision. And there's just so many challenges that we're all faced with right now. And we see every day businesses that have been able to move quickly and be successful and keep growing um, or, or at least if not grow, hold on to the revenue that they had and maybe think of new ways to service folks, but it all comes down to, do you have a good framework for making decisions on the fly? And if you are working off old information, you, you probably don't. <laughs> well, and it's also though that you have a good sense of who your customers are or who your mm -hmm. external stakeholders are. And yep. so you can be more comfortable pivoting if you already yeah. have that or some companies might revamp their research and it might not have to even be that in depth if they already have a lot of information. Well, I think that's the point is I think people get this idea about research that it's big and giant and it can be, but just like, you know, I'm sure if you meet someone and you say you're in PR, they may or may not have the exact idea of what that is, but these are big words, marketing, PR, research, but we're all part of the same landscape that's just trying to solve the same, you know, similar questions and looking at it from different angles. And I think the research I've seen over the last couple of years, and certainly over the last year has been a lot more of this fast, quick, let's, let's talk to 10 customers. Let's talk to 20 clients. Let's do a quick um, focus group of folks that really matter to us because the last thing we want to do in a time like this is lose, lose hold of them. And if you have a good system set up where you can, for example, send a quick email out to, you know, a bunch of people and do a basic survey that collects a little bit of information, again, to screen and make sure that you're not kind of wasting resources talking to the wrong folks, you know, in a couple of weeks you can have, and you saw how quickly we work together. I mean, it takes a lot to plan internally sometimes, but once you know who you want to talk to and you have approval internally and you can schedule it with folks. I mean, it, it can be, you can have a lot of great heavy lift in a couple of weeks and then it's a question of, great, now what do we do with it? So then you sort of step back and, you know, ideally you're collaborating with PR teams and marketing folks and folks who, who both internally at the organization and maybe other partners can take a look at all that and then kind of get creative with, great, this is a lot of information. What can we act on right now? What is something that's a nice to know for the future? Um, what, what have we heard that makes no sense to us? And so maybe we need to kind of dive in a little bit more. And often what happens is it's, it's those questions that lead to really interesting insights. I was thinking about some projects I've done, and this was a project that was pre-COVID. It was about a year and a half ago. With a, with a media brand and they were um, very old and established and had a lot of credibility, but their sales team was having a really hard time selling into some of these new advertising programs that marketing had created. And part of it was, you know, in the last decade, they'd moved from a traditional media brand to mostly online and the sales team was still using old verbiage, sort of outdated sales tools the marketing team members were newer to the organization. So they were bringing all this fresh innovation and thinking and, um, you know, on paper, it should be a no brainer to sell advertising in this way. But many other people internally 
were not in alignment. And so the marketing team was very frustrated because they were coming up with programs. The advertising team was frustrated. And so they needed someone to just talk to their audience. And what ended up happening was we learned that we sent a survey out with the assumption that the client had about who their audience was. And, you know, early on I said, okay, we'll see. We'll pick 15 people we talked to. And the 15 people we talked to were groups that were niche groups that were not even really on their radar. They were not seen as primary groups to market to, but based on the information we learned from them, they quickly were able to shift a couple of their offerings, do sort of an experimental um, advertising outreach. It, it landed immediately well. The response rate was much better because they were suddenly knowing how to market to a different audience, but they didn't even know the audience was there. And mm -hmm. There was, I'm not going to lie, there was some internal politics, right? Because you have sort of old school thinking and new school thinking. I think if that same project had been done this year, we probably would have a lot less of that because people aren't sort of sitting around and debating in rooms for hours and hours. Well, We're just doing the work. <laughs> yeah. Well, also, I do think it helps to bring an outside party in for two reasons. Yeah. So it's everything that you're talking about internally. So that helps right with the ego and whatnot but then also externally when you're doing external interviews people might open up to you a lot easier yeah. if they think you're just that they're not going to offend you right well that's just it i mean you what i do i'm not going to lie i think it's not rocket science right i mean anyone could technically call someone and ask questions right um and the beauty of having an unbiased um and bias is obviously something that we think about a lot um these days an unbiased third party resource who will not, not only not reveal any of your specific details, right? So this is all anonymous, but I have no agenda other than let's make the communications more successful. So sometimes you might have a marketing team internally who has this idea about something they wanna create. And so they're gonna do the research but in their minds, they've already, they are sort of halfway down the road with this vision of, of well, they're going to guide or, the research. Right? I mean, you can guide uh, research. You absolutely can. And, you know, and so the idea that um, you're talking to someone who is a third party is really half the battle. The other part is it says a lot about an organization. And I can't tell you how many times when I reach out to someone to schedule a 30 minute chat, right? Or 45 minutes, an hour, we're not asking a lot of their time, but it's time that no one was ever thinking they would even give to this organization because maybe they're they're a client that isn't returning emails or hasn't bought something from a while or they're even a prospect that has never actually converted to be a client or a customer. And so the expectation was low that I'd ever hear back from them. But what ends up happening pretty quickly is you hear a couple things. You think, wow, this says a lot about this organization that they're taking the time right now to do this. Hmm. That's interesting. Tell me more. What what might they do with this information? And while obviously I can't promise anything, even just saying we really want more perspectives to guide our future efforts. We, well, we want to get we better. Recognize. Yeah, it that is sometimes all it takes for someone to just open up and give a floodgate of information and knowing that that will get back to that organization. Sometimes that's all they need to feel the confidence that you know what. I maybe didn't hear from them in a while, or maybe I had an interaction with them that wasn't great, or maybe the investment we made in their services isn't paying off, but I feel like I'm in good hands because this is a thoughtful leadership team that's taking some time to ask us how they can get better. And so even if I don't write the questions themselves and all I do is ask them, it's a totally different kind of response you can get. And so obviously when you can collaborate and work with other folks to make sure that hey, as long as we're spending this 30 or 45 minutes, let's get as much information as we can. Um, it's typically way less costly to do that than to invest in doing the same old thing or maintaining new, new ideas in an old mindset or just investing resources that aren't effective. So, and how are you brought into projects? Are you brought in mostly by PR people? And then if so, how do you collaborate with them? That's a great question. I, I mean, a lot of my clients are, I would say most of the clients I work with are professional for services firms, whether it's PR teams or a, or a marketing team, or sometimes there's a research firm that needs some backup. Um, and why I love that, I came from the agency world. So I was in the agency 
life for, you know, almost 10 years before going out on my own. So that's, that's, that feels like home to me. Um, and I'm also one person. So I'm always cautious of the fact that I can bring in folks to back me up if needed on the research. And I often do um, because we're either um, needing to do a lot of research all at once, or I just want another perspective when I'm looking at things. But truly what I like about working with PR teams is you're, you're the one that's gonna be able to shape, here are the questions that are gonna help me be successful in planning messaging or thinking about pitching media, or here's something that's keeping me up at night. And I would just love to know a little bit more about these three or four things, because it'll allow me to really creatively get my idea to the next level. Um, and also it's important internally, again, to understand what resources are in place to act on it. So if we come back and we say, your website needs to completely change because nobody is understanding who you are anymore based on your website. You wanna make sure that you have resources in place who can pretty quickly make those changes, right? Um, if you need to launch a new uh, service and there needs to be other technology in place, right? So for example, maybe one of the recommendations is, gosh, I have no time to read emails or I'm not on social media that much, but a podcast could be a really great way to share thought leadership. You as a PR person would wanna make sure that that organization is set up so that pretty quickly, if you're working on content ideas, they can actually execute that, right? Mm -hmm. So understanding what resources are in place is really important before you do this, because the last thing you want is this amazing research insight. And then everybody sort of disappears for months, figuring out how are we gonna get that done? And look, we've all been there. I think that early on when I went out on my own, um, when I moved to Oregon 10 years ago, like a lot of folks that started out, I was just the sort of general marketing consultant because I had worn a lot of hats in, in my career over the years. And it didn't occur to me until a couple of years in, I keep writing these great marketing plans. And then I don't hear back quickly enough about, and I think it's what the client wanted. We work together, but then, and then when you check back in, it's like, you know, we love it so much of it's great, but we just don't, we weren't set up to act on it and we're busy doing other things. And so I honed in on research several years into being on my own because I sort of said to myself, I don't want to be that marketing consultant anymore that comes up with a bunch of things on paper that are internally produced and nobody is actually able to act on it. So research yeah. to me is building it from the, from the, not inside out, but outside in, but you have to be working in communication the whole time so that you have structures in place to move pretty quickly. Well, or you, you, I mean, I just want to reiterate your first step because people might forget your first step is to see what resources are in place and talk internally before you go externally, which I think is very smart. I just don't know. I don't think I knew that honestly. So, um, because well, I think you actually me. brought <laughs> us in. Yeah. And that's, that's what ends up happening, right? Is years of sort of trying things and testing and iterating and failing, right? Um, you realize like, maybe it's not what I'm doing that needs to change. It's just the, the, the seat at the table that is missing is often, what do our customers think? What do our clients think? Or we wanna reach out to a new group of people, but does anyone interact with them? Does anyone really know? And I think, you know, there's so many conversations these days, rightly so about DEI and bringing diverse perspectives into everything we do. And I've always believed that. And that's always been, um, you know, a part of what I have uh, focused on in my work. And research is just one more way to make sure that you have voices that represent not only who you are, but who you want to be and need to be and who the world is around you. Um, one example of like just something as simple, I had a really large scale project um, with another um, communications team um, about a year and a half ago. And we were focusing on the education space. And there was a client that was not succeeding in recruiting folks to um, sign up for their various courses. And so, so much time was spent um, asking the teachers and the professors and the people at the institutions, because it was a, um, both in-person and, and digital, 
find out from just like, tell us more, tell us more. These people are educating people about topics. They're not marketers, they're not communicators. And also they're a teacher. It's not their job to come up with marketing recommendations. And so they got funding through an outside source to do some focus groups. And all we did was, you know, we picked some groups that we knew were underrepresented. And we said to them, we've never really heard from you. We want to know what we can do. And, you know, we kept it very comfortable and very casual. And these, these were different from some of the like sort of professional hardcore like business interviews we do. Cause these are students, these are young people. These are folks that are just maybe um, a couple of years into school and juggling a lot. And what we found pretty quickly was they loved the classes but they didn't see themselves in, for example, the, when you go to the website, the imagery is all white people sitting around an office. And I was speaking to a really diverse group of unbelievably talented people that said, I, I just don't, I just click it off because I don't see myself in that. So all they had to do, and this was direct from them is, could they just get some images up there that look like us? And so kind of on the fly, I grabbed my phone. We took a few like fun, casual photos just for the findings report, right? And that ended up in um, uh, marketing materials at, with their permission, of course. And that wasn't what we were planning on doing, but they were not only excited, but they started using their mobile devices because again, these folks were not using websites and they were sharing it around with their friends because check it out, I'm in this photo. And this wasn't like a marketing gimmick. It wasn't like some sort of PR tactic. This just came from a couple of women saying to me that that's not who I am. Well, right. yeah. And it also people, so they feel honored when you ask them for help yeah. and advice. And so it doesn't matter who it is, if it's a younger person or, you know, a CEO, if we ask for advice and for help, we are more obliged to help because it's, yeah. it's an honor, you know? So, um, yeah, so good job. So, um, I could just listen to you all day and uh, I'm sure everyone else could, Likewise. But I just, last question is, um, you mentioned that you were at a PR firm for 10 years. I'm just curious, were you in a research capacity and what, like, I know that it's a big industry for some of the bigger firms, hopefully still, to have a research department. Is that true? Yeah, I was actually at, I started in PR, um, but then I moved into a various sort of full service marketing firms that offered both PR marketing and then research. My role was actually more marketing the firm and doing business development to bring in clients. Um, and I think that's where I really relate to any client that needs to bring on new business or is pitching and not um, getting the success they want. Um, and also sees the beauty of when you do have something that aligns really well with a client. I think um, a lot of PR firms today, if they're giant, do have um, internal research folks who may do things like create surveys. And, and I think the beauty for PR folks right now is there is a lot of that secondary research out there. I mean, you can literally go and Google almost anything. And many large companies have commissioned research that gives you some sense of what consumers are thinking or feeling. And um, there's no shortage of that. And I think if you aren't a giant um, firm that has an in-house um, resource you can turn to, obviously there's folks like us who you can work with in a, in a much smaller capacity. Um, you also can do it, I, I don't wanna say you could do it on your own and get the same results. But for example, I've done a lot of work with nonprofits and if they don't have the resources to actually hire someone, I coach them behind the scenes to say, here's how we set it up. Here's the process. I'm gonna give you all the guidance. I will write the screener. I will write the survey. I will help you with the questions. And then maybe you have a board member or you know someone who's not a staff person who can do the interviews. So you don't really have to have a big budget um, and I, I love doing, you know, small, quick coaching projects just to help companies think about like, could we even do this and what would it look like? I think truly it can be much simpler than people think. Often the, the biggest obstacle is internal, right? So it's, are we culturally ready to ask some questions, maybe ask some tough questions um, and act on that? And when I think about something that I typically require, and I'm pretty sure we did it with yours, was when I schedule out and I'm literally in my agreement and we schedule everything out, 
I literally have a you know, finding session early on and then another one a couple weeks later because I know that typically what happens is it's information overload, people are busy, there's a lot of things to think about. Sometimes there's other resources that folks need and, and that's fine. But you need to make sure that everybody holds each other honest and accountable for all this great information or you know what, it's gonna go right on the shelf, it's gonna go in the drawer and not only will it have been not time well spent but people then feel guilty that they know this and not doing anything. We don't have to do that. We okay. don't have to do that. So you help. Okay. So that you're very thoughtful because you've, you've been in sales, you've been in marketing. Yeah. Been, yeah. It's not just research. Okay. And, and really my background was in sales early on and uh, marketing and sales. And I kept saying, I'm not a salesperson, right? Cause I'm, I'm a marketer, but ultimately, as you know, they're all connected, right? Because we're all selling. You might be selling an idea or a concept or a product or a service, but you need to make sure that you are positioning yourself well for whoever you're talking to. And so once I sort of got over that um, idea, I, I think a lot just about insights that drive revenue growth and um, who doesn't want to grow um, or make better use of the resources they have. And look, we're all just trying to help each other out right now. So um, we, we all have to keep connecting and collaborating, which is why it's so fun to see you again. And uh, yeah. Yay. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, this was great. And I love Zoom because now I get to I see know. my friends. And, and really, I just want to say this. Don't be afraid. No one should be afraid to tackle this. And even if you don't enlist anyone's help, um, you know, there are some simple things you can do internally. And um, uh, there's a lot of great information out there. And I'm always happy to chat with someone if they just want a few terms demystified. And, you know, we can connect later about that. But um, we are all at a moment in time where information is everywhere and yet there's maybe not the clarity we once had and so i think getting different perspectives on anything you're thinking about is is really powerful